I have spent the last 48 hours pulling my hair out, trying to come up with some finalized Oscar predictions, but you know what? I did it. Are they right? Probably not. What's up, Flick fans? Welcome back to my channel. Today, we're going to go through every single category. I'm going to give you my finalized Oscar predictions. I'm not predicting who I think is going to win, but these will be laid out in order of what I believe has the best chance to get a nomination and in the five spot, or in best picture case, it's the 10 spot, what I believe has the least best chance of getting a nomination. And like I said, this has been the most difficult time I've had trying to come up with predictions. I can't even talk. Also, I'm only doing 20 categories because first of all, I can, and second of all, I don't know anything about the shorts, so whatever I would tell you would just be straight BS, and you don't deserve that. Or do you? By the way, if you're here and you want to support this video, leave your predictions down below, specifically Best Picture. I want to know the Best Picture 10. We know there are 10 slots this year. Uh, what is the final movie? And that's the most difficult spot, but we're not starting with Best Picture. We're starting with Best Documentary, and I'll be honest with you, this is the one where I have the least confidence only because I just don't really, I mean, I haven't seen all of the documentaries in competition. I do have a lot of confidence in the first four. These are the four that for a long time have been firmly in the conversation. All the Beauty and the Bloodshed, Fire of Love, All That Breathes, Navalny. A lot of people are putting Descendant in that final spot, and for good reason. I'm going to go out on a limb, and I feel like I do this every year, at least every year in this category. I'm putting Moon Age Daydream in that fifth spot. First of all, because I just love the movie, so uh, that should not impact my predictions, but it kind of is, and this is one of those categories I know I'm not firmly in that conversation anyways, but something about Moon Age Daydream, and I get it, this is not the kind of documentary they usually want to put in that top five. It's different, it's a little bit outlandish, but it's dealing with a topic that I think is going to resonate with viewers, and while Descendants a good movie, and that's the one people are putting in above it, I, I just want to be a little bit different from the crowd. So I'm putting Moon Age Daydream at number five, and uh, let's go to the next one. Best song. Again, I'm trying to be a little bit different here. Not only separate myself from Gold Derby, but from my peers. So I did have Carolina from Where the Crawdads Sing, because I'm like, oh, everybody loves Taylor Swift. But you look at applause, tell it like a woman. I just think there's no way that song misses the boat, and there's definitely no way those other four miss the boat. The one that I have the most confidence in right now, obviously, is Not To Not To, just because it's been performing so well recently. And then you have songs like Lift Me Up and Hold My Hand. There's no way they miss. This is pretty easy, so I think we can move on. I have a great feeling it's going to be these five. Best sound. Obviously, they combined the two sound categories a couple of years ago. I don't love the fact that they did that, but it does make it easier to do predictions, at least. Top Gun, Maverick, Avatar, Elvis. Those are the three that I'm very confident in. Because of the resurgence in All Quiet on the Western Front, I feel like that's going to get the fourth spot. The fifth spot for me is up in the air. Could be everything, everywhere, all at once. It could be the Batman. But you look at the crew uh, that actually worked on all of the sound design in the Batman, and the list of nominations is ridiculously long. And because I feel like everything, everywhere is going to actually miss in some of these more minor categories, which could hurt its best picture chances but I don't know if Banshees is going to do all that well in these other categories as well. So I'm actually going to go with the Batman. I think another movie to talk about as a possible contender here is Babylon. You could see that sneak in over the Batman. A little bit of Batman bias here. I would love to see it get all these technical noms. But again, I think it's like 20-something nominations for the crew that worked on this. And the industry loves them. So I feel like that's the movie that gets in. International feature, this one's fairly easy, and I actually think I have the same order as Gold Derby, at least the last time that I looked at it, but how could you not, right? All Quiet is going to have a ton of nominations, I feel like. Decision to Leave, very successful director that has the second best chance. Argentina 1985, as we know, the big surprise a couple of weeks, or was it like a week ago? I'm getting my time periods confused. Close, great movie, deserves to be on there. That fifth spot, I'm thinking to myself, okay, it's going to be Bardo, because Bardo has a shot to get another nomination we're going to talk about. It's going to be EO, a very artsy type of movie, but are voters really going to vote for EO? You see The Quiet Girl get that adapted screenplay nomination at the BAFTAs, and that is immediately just a light bulb went off in my head. I said, oh, well, how could it not get nominated at the Oscars if it gets that uh, extremely surprising nomination at the BAFTAs? So I feel like this five is fairly easy, but be on the lookout for something like Bardo. I know I'm trying to be right here, but I feel like somewhere... <laughs> I did this with Golden Globes too, and it came back to bite me in the butt. But somewhere within these technical noms, there has to be a major surprise. And 
as you can see on my list, there is one major surprise. I think there are four movies that are fairly safe. Avatar, <laughs> duh, uh, Top Gun Maverick, All Quiet the Batman. Those movies are looking pretty good right now. That fifth spot normally goes to a Marvel movie. You have Black Panther, you have Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. But this year, there's that feeling all across the industry. Well, Marvel, you know, they've taken a step down, and uh, all of the talk about the effects crew not being able to get everything done in time. There's just a lot about them that doesn't give me confidence. A movie like 13 Lives, they have the Bake Off every year, and that apparently performed very well, and people are talking about that. So that actually may be the best movie to nominate in this fifth spot. But I'm going with a surprise here, a movie that's it got a little bit of talk here and there, a couple of nominations, but there's always one, I feel like, in the visual effects category that just blows me away. You look at the VS, you look at the BAFTAs and all the movies that got nominated. I'm going out on a limb. I'm thinking Nope is a movie that's gotten a little bit of talk, but not a lot of love. I think this may be the place to where something really surprising happens, and I'm you know, I'm probably not going to be right here, but I just, I want it to be there because I just have this feeling about it. What am I basing this off of specifically? My heart. And that's all that matters. I guess I could also mention Jurassic World and Fantastic Beasts, but none of the movies in either of those franchises has ever gotten a visual effects domination. So why would I start now? Best score. Austin. How do you not have The Fablemans in there? Well, The Fablemans is the one movie that I decided to leave off at kind of the last second because I just feel like you listen to it. Yes, it's John Williams. How are they not going to go with John Williams? You listen to it. It's very subtle. And I don't know if the people voting in this category are going to appreciate the subtleness of what this score has to offer. Now, clearly John Williams... That's going to motivate a lot of people to vote that direction. So now that I'm thinking about that, I'm feeling a little bit less confident in this. But I am uh, designating that fifth spot to All Quiet on the Western Front because of the recent surge and the fact that I think this movie is going to get a lot of technical nominations, a lot of those second tier nominations. And you listen to that score, it's very showy. It's very loud in a good way. I think it benefits the film. The other four are very safe at this point. Banshees of Inishir and Babylon, Pinocchio, women talking. I believe the other one that could be, should be in the conversation probably is Gorenson's score for Black Panther Wakanda Forever. We know how well it did with the very first movie, and that score was great. I thought the score here was still really good, maybe a slight step down. People may feel that way, but again, the surge of All Quiet on the Western Front, I have a feeling it could push it into that fifth spot, but this one is more up in the air compared to some of the categories we've talked about. So now things are starting to get... A little interesting. Boy, now that I'm looking at these as we go along and just seeing the way I have it laid out, I have the Fablemans missing in a lot of these categories that just a month ago, everybody's like, oh, well, Fablemans is getting a production design nomination. I just a month ago had it in that category, but I'm once again kind of replacing it with All Quiet on the Western Front. I think that has a really great chance, but technically, if you look at the way I have this structured, I'm replacing it with Black Panther Wakanda Forever. I have the least confidence in Black Panther only because it's been slightly underperforming at a lot of these other award shows. And uh, not just in this category, but in pretty much every category other than Angela Bassett, right? So I believe Gold Derby has it third on this list. I don't have that amount of confidence. I have it fifth, but I do think it sneaks in over a Fableman's. And again... I think The Fablemans is going to be that movie this year that gets snubbed in a lot of these more minor categories. And I think the only other movie that would be in conversation is Glass Onion, but I don't think that gets in. Animated feature. I feel like I'm going to regret this. I'm going to regret going with more of my brain, more than my gut, at the last second, which is kind of the opposite of what I normally do. I usually go with my gut. My gut tells me, no, not Wendell and Wild. My gut tells me The Sea Beast. And I switched it at the last second. I switched it to My Father's Dragon. I just don't think Wendell and Wilde has the love and support. And it's got the nominations. You look at the Annie nominations, uh, My Father's Dragon, Wendell and Wilde. They're both fairly successful, right? But My Father's Dragon comes from Cartoon Saloon. Cartoon Saloon is a beloved studio. I think that's going to give it the slight edge over Wendell and Wilde. Austin, why'd you have the Sea Beast on there? 
Well, the Sea Beast has done okay for the most part, but there's something about, I mean, one of the more successful animated movies that Netflix has ever had, so the success on that level, but also uh, just comparing it to some of the other movies in this category, I just have a really good feeling about it. The top four, they're getting in. Pixar's getting the movie in, Puss in Boots, Marcel, Pinocchio, the best of quality. So, of course, they're getting in. But it's that fifth spot. For me, I'm going with My Father's Dragon. The Sea Beast gets a nomination. I'm going to scream loud. Makeup and hairstyling. I said I wanted to be different today. A lot of people are uh, nominating Black Panther here, Babylon, uh, even Amsterdam in this category because we have Amsterdam in another category we're going to talk about. I'm going blonde. And here's why. I think Ana de Armas gets in for Best Actress. And because I believe that, I feel like they're going to look at her character and the fact that Blonde has kind of made its way into the makeup and hairstyling conversation. But because we're dealing with a real figure here and a big part of allowing her to look like Marilyn Monroe, allowing these other characters to look like the people that they're representing on screen, I think this is going to be in the back of people's minds when they're voting for makeup and hairstyling. The other four are very easy, especially the whale and the Batman. Well, really, and Elvis. So I think the top three, very easy, all quiet, been making that surge. Blonde, I think, gets in over Black Panther and Babylon. Costume design. Black Panther, easy. Elvis, Woman King, Babylon. Fairly easy, in my opinion. The Woman King, it, it was out for a long time of the conversation, but I'm sitting here going, why Why is this? Is, look at the movie. The costume design is incredible. How do you not put that in there? Mrs. Harris Goes to Paris is the one that a lot of people are putting in that fifth spot. You also have Everything Everywhere and The Fablemans and uh, Glass Onion and Living. Man, this one. And you look at Gold Derby, Amsterdam is way down there. But I've heard some talk of people appreciating some of those aspects, the makeup and hairstyling, the costume design for Amsterdam. So I think it has a pretty good shot at both. I'm going, and I think it might have been the BAFTA surprise that just kind of, for some reason, made me look at this movie that I don't like and say, I think that might be a surprise. There's going to be a shock in one of these two categories, and it could be any of the ones that I just listed, but I think the most shocking for a lot of people would be Amsterdam. So I'm going to Amsterdam, and I got my fingers crossed. Well... The movie was fine, but the costume design was good. Adapted, screenplay, the first three are very easy. The Whale, which I'm putting it above Women Talking because I think Women Talking is not going to get a lot of appreciation at the Oscars. But being one of the best scripts of the year, I still think it has the second best shot to get a nomination here. Glass Onion, for me, that's pretty much a lock at this point. All Quiet on the Western Front is not a lock. But I think it has a great chance because, again, of that resurgence at the BAFTAs and uh, kind of the talk about it right before the BAFTAs actually hit. Living is the movie that many people are putting firmly in the conversation. I'm going with She Said. When I walked out of She Said at the New York Film Festival, I said, oh, it's easy getting an adapted screenplay nomination uh, because it's the type of movie that runs almost specifically off of the screenplay. Obviously, you have some great performances in there. But the performances aren't really being talked about. The reason I'm putting it above living is because everybody's talking about Bill Nye's performance in living. I don't hear a lot of people talking about the screenplay. And it's not that that screenplay is bad. She said, got the BAFTA nod. And if I added it up correctly, it's the third most nominated of any of these movies all awards season. How does it not get in, right? Again, I think All Quiet has a bit better of a chance at this point. But I'm putting She Said above living. I think it has the fifth best shot. Is there any debate on any of these five? You know, some people would say Everything Everywhere is above Banshees at this point, and maybe I still have that confidence in Banshees, though. I know lately it's been Everything Everywhere screenplay, but I still have so much confidence in Banshees, so I'm going to put it slightly above that. The Fablemans, duh, tar, duh. I guess the only one here would be Triangle of Sadness. Can After Sun, can Charlotte Wells get in that conversation? possibly. But Triangle of Sadness has done very well. And there's one thing about that movie that stands out. And again, I I didn't love Triangle as much as a lot of other people, but it is the screenplay. And if anything gets a nomination, it is a screenplay. Maybe supporting actress, but probably screenplay. Editing. I don't know, man. I'm going with my gut here. I'm putting everything everywhere with the best chance after the recent success with the movie, but that doesn't take away from Top Gun Maverick's possibility. People love movies that are edited like Elvis in the industry, so I think Elvis gets the nomination. All Quiet on the Western Front. That editing is absolutely spectacular. The Fablements... I, 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 
I'm not feeling good about myself giving the Fablemans a lack of these nominations. So I think they're going to come in and steal one of these. Which one? I don't know. I have no clue which one the Fablemans inevitably gets. I don't think it's going to be this one, though. I have confidence in Babylon over Banshees of Inishirin, which should be in the conversation, over Avatar The Way of Water. I think Babylon is flashy, showy, Damien Chazelle style editing that people in the industry love. And if Babylon doesn't get one of these nominations that I'm sliding it in for, then it doesn't have a best picture chance. I see people nominating Babylon for best picture and I'm like, it has to get something if that is the case. That doesn't mean I nominated ba Babylon, uh, but I feel like editing is the most probable one because you look at that style of editing and I don't know how people in the industry do not at least think about it when they're nominating these other films. It's going to be hard to throw it in over something like The Fablemans, but again, I watch The Fablemans and I'm like, yes, it's a very well-made, well-put-together movie, but editing, is it as stylistic and flashy as people in the industry love? Cinematography, and everybody always says, especially people on Twitter, the rule of thumb is to go with four out of the five ASC nominations and then to focus on BAFTAs, obviously. You have a movie like Avatar that has been missing some of these more major nominations. You have uh, Bardo that has kind of made a bit of a surge lately. I think it got the ASC. I want to say it got the ASC. I don't feel very good about Bardo. And I just don't like the idea of nominating Bardo if it doesn't get an international feature nomination. And I know people will tell you otherwise, but that just makes me feel icky insight. So what movie am I putting in that spot? Well, I have the fifth most confidence in Elvis. I understand it got ASC and I think it got the British Society and BAFTAs. And so it's it's done very well. It's clean house. The Batman. People like Fraser as a DP. All Quiet on the Western Front is the movie that people are going to be like, what? But it didn't get the... But the BAFTA love and the technical noms and what stands out about the movie to me more than anything, anything, is the cinematography. And so that is almost a given with All Quiet on the Western Front. So I actually have a ton of confidence in All Quiet on the Western Front. Top Gun, obviously, Roger Deakins, Empire of Light. Not his best work, but it's Roger Deakins. So be on the lookout for movies like Babylon and Avatar, Bardo, The Fablemans. I just, I don't see it getting in. Supporting Actress. I think I'm in line with Gold Derby on this one, even though I believe Angela Bassett should be number one. She has by far the best chance of getting Winning, not to spoil my prediction there, but Angela Bassett, Carrie Condon, Hong Chow. I would say she's a bit more of a lock than Jamie Lee Curtis, only because The Whale lately has just been going up, up, up. The Whale's been going crazy as of late. Then you have Jamie Lee Curtis, who's been nominated pretty much everywhere you can get nominated, but the love for Stephanie Hsu is abundant, and I feel the exact same way. I feel as if she could possibly maybe get in, and th th that's only if they choose one here. I don't think they're going to choose one. I think they both get in. But if they choose one, I think the industry's going to feel a little bit differently about Jamie Lee Curtis. And not that she was bad in the movie. She's great in the movie, but I think Stephanie kind of one-ups her, in my opinion, even though Curtis at this point has gotten all the love. That being said, Dolly De Leon, if Triangle of Sadness gets a Best Picture nomination tomorrow, when they announce it, you're going to know at that point that Dolly De Leon got in in the five spot. There's no way Triangle gets in at Best Picture, doesn't get in at Best Supporting Actress. So if we're watching these nominations, or on Tuesday, I'm sorry, if we're watching these on Tuesday and Dolly De Leon gets in, I'm going to slap my head and go, ah, ugh, ooh, eek, ooh, uh, I was wrong. But, you know, I just have faith in the love for everything, everywhere, all at once, and I don't have faith that Triangle of Sadness gets a Best Picture nomination. Supporting Actor, I am so inconsistent in these predictions. You know why? Because, well, the top four for me, they're fairly easy. I think Barry, I think Paul Dano, I think Brendan, I think uh, Ki Kwan. I think they are all four in. I'm not of the mindset that Judd Hirsch is going to get in and Paul Dano is going to miss. No, I think the love for Dano is strong this year. I don't buy Eddie Redmayne, and I don't know why. It, it kind of reminds me of when Jared Leto was getting all, and I think this movie's better than whatever that, I can't remember the name of that movie. I think this movie's better, right? But Jared Leto was getting love in all these places, and we're like, uh-oh, oh boy. And we get to Oscar morning, or nomination morning, 
Then we're all sitting here like, Jared Leto's getting a nomination. And then, out of the blue, a surprise. And I think of, was it last year when Jesse Plemons, out of nowhere, out of nowhere, got the nomination? I'm not buying it. I'm not buying Eddie Redmayne. I think one of these other actors comes out of nowhere. And a lot of people are going to say, well, then Brad Pitt has the best shot for Babylon. But again, I think Babylon is not going to get the love that people expect it to get. Brian Tyree Henry, I would probably say, has a better shot than Brad Pitt. People love Tyree Henry. I thought it was a great performance. I'm going with Judd Hirsch. And even though, again, inconsistency, even though I'm saying Fablemans get shut out in a lot of these more technical-ish categories, I think here, where it's at its strongest, is the acting the performances, and you're going to laugh at me here in just a second when I show you a different category, but I think here, Judd Hirsch gets in. So I think Judd Hirsch is going to get in over Eddie Redmayne. I think that's going to be a snub, according to, because Redmayne's gotten pretty much all you can get. Uh, Some of these I'm just not buying. Best Actress. You remember just now when I was saying if... (laughs) If Fablemans gets in, it's going to be the acting. Um, well, you know, Michelle Williams, she's scared me lately, right? And Judd Hirsch, I guess, has technically scared me, too. But there is more competition in this category compared to supporting actor, in my opinion. And supporting actor, you have one or two people that could step in. And here, you know, Michelle Williams didn't get the BAFTA, didn't get SAG. It is a very similar argument to what we're going to talk about with Tom Cruise. But I'm going the opposite direction. This time, because the competition is tough. Margot Robbie, Anna de Armas, Viola Davis, Michelle Williams. Those are the four that are in that conversation of who's getting in, who's not getting in, where's everybody going. Uh, The top three are safe. They're in. Absolutely. I think Viola Davis, she has had most of the precursors that you need to get her to that safe position. But she is one that I could see as a snub come Oscar nomination morning. Ana de Armas, Golden Globes, BAFTA, SAG. They love her. They don't love the movie. She's playing an iconic human being. The movie didn't do very well. My brain is torn into three different places. I'm like, does she get in even though they don't love the movie? Even though Michelle Williams is in a movie that everybody loves. And Michelle Williams probably gives the best performance in that movie. But she has a lot more competition than Paul Dano and Judd Hirsch. I just don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen, but my gut is telling me, Ana de Armas, the precursor love, but also look who she is playing in Blonde. I don't know how she doesn't get in. So maybe Viola Davis has the fifth best uh, odds here, but I'm going both of those over Michelle Williams, over Margot Robbie, but more importantly, over Michelle Williams. Best actor. Hmm... (laughs) <laughs> I've seen a lot of people on Twitter just go and say, well, why are people still nominating Tom Cruise? Why are people... He didn't get the Golden Globe. Okay. You know why he didn't get the Golden Globe? Because he gave his Golden Globes back. He gave them back a couple of years ago. They're not going to nominate him. Unless it's another, like, Magnolia-level performance where it's undeniable. They're not going to nominate him for Top Gun. It's not happening. He gave his awards back. You're going to say, well, they don't have any bias. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. People vote with bias. They just do. They're going to tell you they don't, but they do. That's human nature. Okay. Didn't get the sack. That one, (laughs) that one's a little more like, oh, okay. But Paul Mescal didn't get the sack either. Am I going to go with Adam Sandler? No. Do I want to go with Adam Sandler? Absolutely. But no, I just don't trust that they're going to vote for Adam Sandler, especially when they came out a couple years ago with Uncut Gems. They're like, nah, he's too funny. Too funny. Not going to vote for him. Too funny. He's a too, fun- too funny of a guy. Too many jokes. Ha ha. What is that? Going off on a tangent. I'm choosing Tom Cruise because I just feel like Top Gun Maverick is one of those movies where I could see someone riding the coattails of that into another nomination. Is it going to be for Best Director? Well... DGA, right? Could be Best Director. I I don't think it is going to be Best Director. Who's it more likely to be? It's more likely to be Tom Cruise. Only because Paul Mescal, who got the BAFTA nom. Okay. Paul Mescal got the BAFTA nom. That's a big deal, right? So I think he has a really good opportunity. But then I look at the Oscar voters and I'm like, 
did everyone see After Sun? Does everyone take this smaller, more independent movie seriously in a performance that comes from this? And I guess you could say the same thing about Bill Nighy, but Bill Nighy, he's been getting nominated everywhere. So I look at this fifth spot and I say, Paul Mescal, I think he deserves it. I think his performance is amazing. But this is not one where I go with my heart. It's one where I go with my gut. My gut tells me Tom Cruise. My gut honestly tells me someone other than Paul Mescal. Could it be Hugh Jackman? Bad movie? Good performance. People like his performance. So, um, I guess if I was being consistent with the Ana de Armas vote, I would go Hugh Jackman because, again, you know, The Sun, bad movie. People like the performance. But I'm going to go with Tom Cruise. I think he writes the coattails of Top Gun Maverick. I'm not opposed to it. I thought he did a great job in Top Gun Maverick. I love the movie. My brain. Best director. Other than my order here, I think I'm pretty consistent with Gold Derby. I have the Daniels for Everything Ever All at Once. Martin McDonough for Banshees. Todd Field for Tar. Steven Spielberg. I know Steven Spielberg didn't get the bath to love, but he's Steven Spielberg. And this is where I think the movie is going to have some success. And director and, uh, you know, supporting actor, those types of categories. Edward Berger. Is it Berger or Berger? I want to say Berger because yeah, typical American. I say Berger. I think that's probably Berger. So Berger. Director and screenplay at the BAFTAs, but I go further than that. I look at recent international entries into the Oscar conversation, Drive My Car, Another Round, and the director noms, and a lot of the times the surprising director noms that have come from that. Uh, Rajamouli from RRR, I think that's another possibility, and it would make a lot of sense if it does get that coveted 10th spot with the best picture noms. But I am going to go with the resurgence, or the surgence as of late, with All Quiet on the Western Front, uh, Rajamouli has a shot. James Cameron has has a shot. Kaczynski got the DGA now. I think it has a shot. But I don't feel as confident with Kaczynski in the director's chair as I do Tom Cruise with the lead actor position. So this one is fairly difficult. I guess I could say Baz Luhrmann as well. I just, I just don't know if people are going to go for that. And finally, Best Picture. I'm not going to bring up all of the honorable mentions that there could be, right? I don't want to sit here and talk about in grave detail movies like Women Talking and Babylon and Triangle of Sadness and Glass Onion, even though I think all of those have a great shot. Babylon has a really good chance to get in, and I'm going to feel really dumb if Babylon starts really racking up some of these smaller nominations, some of the technical noms, and Brad Pitt gets in for supporting actor, then I'm going to sit back and go, uh oh. <laughs> oh boy. Oh boy. And part of me thinks that putting RRR on the end of this list, because that's what we're focused on here. It's the 10th spot. I guess the whale is up in the air. That's the one I also question. Here's what I'll tell you are locks at this point. Everything Everywhere, Banshees of Inishirin, The Fablemans. There's going to be your competition for Best Picture. I think those are the really the ones that have the best shot. That second tier there. Elvis, getting the love. Top Gun Maverick. I don't care if it didn't get in for the BAFTA. It's been getting the love here in the U.S. specifically. Tar, great shot. Haven't been hearing as much about Tar lately. Still think it's a lock. Avatar The Way of Water. It's been cooling off lately. Two billion dollars? Hey, that's going to make its way into this category. All Quiet on the Western Front. I think that's a lock at this point. 14 BAFTA nominations. 14. And I see a lot of nominations here at the Oscars. The Whale? I question The Whale. I question the love for The Whale. I question the love for... The movie itself, beyond the performances, beyond Hong Chow and Brennan Fraser. Although, I will feel a lot better. Fraser. Sorry, Fraser. I'll feel a lot better if Hong Chow gets that nomination, and then you get the screenplay, and I'm sitting here like, okay, well, I think it's going to get Best Picture. I really do. Mm. The 10th spot. The 10th spot. I, I think RRR is 14th or 15th on Gold Derby. There's been a lot of RRR love. You think about the possibility of these Academy screenings, and what I've heard from some of these screenings, the rowdiness, the love, the, the viral videos that are going on constantly. I'm just, I feel this love for RRR that hasn't quite been the case. And you could say, well, Austin, it didn't get the BAFTAs. It didn't get the BAFTA nominations. What's going on there? Well, I mean, you look at how that aspect of the movie was portrayed. I don't want to get into that right now because it's not the place. But there's a reason why it didn't get a BAFTA nomination. Watch the movie. <laughs> and then there's the thought of it not being able to get that international feature nomination because India decided to go with a different movie and that's a different conversation for a different day. But I just feel like the love for the U.S. is maybe even stronger than most of the other countries. 
So, and I and I want to do something weird here. I, I don't want to go your typical Babylon or women talking because women talking has been dying as of late. Babylon, it just hasn't gotten the love. And there's a lot of divisiveness with Babylon. I feel like everybody that watches RRR loves it. Well, not everyone, obviously, but a lot of people, right? Babylon, Letterbox loves it. IMDb thinks it's okay. Critics weren't too high on it. Um, the other movies in this conversation, Triangle of Sadness, hasn't really gotten the exposure of some of these other films. But again, if Dolly De Leon gets in, I'm going to be like, oh, Triangle's probably going to get the best picture nomination. Glass Onion, not as good as the first. I don't know if Glass Onion gets in. The Woman King, I think, has a shot. Black Panther, Wakanda Forever, I think it has a shot. So this 10th spot's so up in the air and so random, it's going to end up being a random movie. And you know what? It's probably going to end up being Babylon. Because Babylon is a movie about Hollywood. So that feels like the easy choice. I'm going with the less easy choice. I'm going with the movie that I felt a surge from about a month ago. And for some reason, I feel like we may, we may get some love again. It's a bit of an out there pick. But at least I'll get 9 out of 10, right? The whale? Don't fail me. Don't fail me, the whale. Okay, this video's been long enough. If you're here and you want to drop a thumbs up, that would be cool. Be sure to leave your best picture, specifically your best picture nominations down below. Why am I wrong? Why will I be wrong? I'll be wrong on some of these. There's no doubt. Some of them, I went out on a limb. Other ones, I trusted what the, the sources, what the, the research says. But you can't do that for everything. Then it's not fun. Then it just becomes data. And this is fun for me. I like, uh, I like predicting things. I don't like being wrong, though. You'll see tears on Tuesday if I'm wrong. That's not true. All right, guys. Thanks for watching. See you soon.